what kind of example are you? What kind of example are you? Is that even a question that you ask yourself? Most people really don't, I mean, because they don't really see themselves as an example. But ask yourself that right now. What type of example am I? Am I a good example or am I a bad example? Am I a positive example or am I a negative example? What kind of example are you? Because the truth of the matter is you don't get a choice in the matter if you're going to be an example. The only choice you get to make is am I going to be a good example or am I going to be a poor example? But the fact is, you are an example every day to someone. You're an example to your wife. You're an example to your husband. You're an example to your children. You're certainly an example to the people who you work with and that work for you. You are an example every day. And you have to make that choice what type of example you're going to be. And many times, if we ask ourselves what type of example we are, we probably think, you know, I'm, I'm not all that bad. In fact, when I first came in the Air Force, I thought I was a pretty good example. I had quickly become the number one airman in, in my squadron. I, I, I was the, the squadron airman of the year. And, and because of that, I, I got special privileges. In fact, they allowed me to play what we called then varsity sports, basketball. I was a late bloomer. I, I was no good in, in, in high school. My brother was an All-American. Some will tell you he's the best pure shooting guard that ever came out of the state of Arizona. They don't even remember my name. But when I got into the military, all of a sudden I discovered my shot, and, and it was a beautiful thing. I was all that in a bag of chips. And so I was on the court all the time and working on my jump shot, and I became the captain of the Shaw Air Force Base basketball team, and we would travel up and down the East Coast. Every weekend it seemed like we had a tournament, and it seemed like inevitably it would come down to me taking the winning shot, and I made it. I was good. <laughs> I was really good, and I was starting to be really impressed with myself. The only problem was I had a wife and two kids, and my wife was pregnant. In fact, we had just gone to uh, that, 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 natal, that prenatal checkup, and she was in her eighth month of, of pregnancy, which to me meant I had four more weeks of basketball. <laughs> and so I left that weekend to play basketball, and we had a tournament at Seymour Johnson. We drove up there, and it was a great tournament comes down to the last shot, I take it, I get fouled, I go to the line, this is a piece of cake, because I have practiced free throws, and I can make these with my eyes closed. First one, I just called it swish, baby. Didn't even watch, and I heard it. And the next one again, swish, baby, and it went in. And we won the game, and they carried me off the court. And we're celebrating, I go back to my queue, and I'm sitting in the queue, and I hear a knock at the door. And at the door are these two security policemen. I had seen them at the game, so obviously they came to get my autograph. Because <laughs> I was all that in a bag of chips. And they said, are you Airman Ellison? And I said, yes, I am. They said, well, we just got a call from the desk sergeant at Shaw Air Force Base, and they dispatched a, a patrol car to your house because your wife's in labor. Oh, snap. So now I've got to go round up everybody and get them back on the bus so that we can drive all night and get back to Shaw Air Force Base because my wife's having a baby. And so when we get there, I tell them, just take me to the hospital because that's where she is and drop me off. I'll get a ride home later. And so I go up to the third floor of the maternity ward, and she is standing at the desk. And the first thing she said to me, have they told you yet? Have they told you yet? And I said, no. She said, you are so lucky. You are so lucky. She said, I had made up my mind. If this was daughter number three, I was going to leave your sorry ass. <laughs> <laughs> but you have a son, and a son needs a father. And so I'm going to stay around, but you need to understand, you need to change. You can't rip and run up and down the streets like you don't have a care in the world. I don't care that these other people think you're great. You are failing at home. You are not there for your children. And you need to stop doing the things that you want to do and start doing the things you need to do. And that's the last time that I played varsity sports. And instead, she told me, whatever our children are involved in, I need to be involved in. If they're going to play sports, you need to be there. If they're going to do scouts, you need to be there. Whatever they do, you need to be there. You need to be a good father to your children. And so you're looking at a man that coached his children in whatever sports that they wanted to do, whatever activities. We were at the school all the time. Now, I'm not a big baseball fan, never played baseball. 
but my kids wanted to play baseball, so I coached baseball out of a book. I coached my son in football. I coached him in basketball all through high school. I even coached my daughters in cheerleading. I didn't even know it was a sport. It was amazing. I did the Vaseline on the teeth and all that stuff so that when they smiled, <laughs> those cheerleaders know what I'm talking about. You know, you got to smile. You got, or if you don't smile, you get bad marks. And if your teeth dry out, then your lips stick to the, to the top and, and it looks like your snaggle tooth and the judges mark you down. <laughs> I'm an all-around coach. <laughs> we had a tournament in Norfolk. And the bridges washed out. And so none of the teams from Northern Virginia could come down. Now, our cheerleading squad, they were, they were lousy. They, were, they had never placed. But if you've ever been to a cheerleading competition, the trophies are larger than the cheerleaders. And I was like, wow. There's only one other team in the competition, so we've got second place. We're going to get a trophy. This is going to be wonderful. So I did the girls' hair, and, and I did their lips, and I did everything, and we went out, and my daughter says, then we don't have to do the pyramid. My oldest daughter was the flyer. If you're a cheerleader, you know what that means. She's on top of the pyramid. She still has back problems today for being dropped so many times. I said, yes, do the pyramid, but it always falls. Don't worry, we've got second place. They did the pyramid. It fell. <laughs> it's OK. We've got second place. At the end of the competition, the judges began to announce who got what. And when they came to us, the Langley Mighty Mites, they said third place. And all the little girls looked at me, and I'm like, what? Third place? How does that happen? How does that happen? There's only two teams in the competition. And the judge said, coach, be thankful you got third. You were so bad, we just gave it to you just because. <laughs> but the truth is, we took third place in a two-team competition, and none of you can make that comment. What type of example are you? What type of example of you? I like to do an exercise. If you have a piece of paper, fold it in half and tear off one piece. And on that piece of paper, what I want from you is to think about the absolute worst supervisor that you've ever had in your entire career, the first worst leader, the, the worst commander. And if the person is sitting next to you, write somebody else's name. <laughs> you, you, not a good career move if that person is near you. While you're doing that, what I'm going to talk to you about is my worst. It happened to coincide with the absolute most difficult assignment that I had in my military career, which is an assignment to Turkey. Back in the day, Turkey was one of the worst assignments that you could receive. It was a remote assignment. It was so bad that, that nobody want, wanted to go there. The, the saying was, it's not the end of the world, but you can see it from here. That was Turkey. It was before video phones. It was before Skype. It was before cell phones. Your only contact to the world was a five-minute call once a month that in the middle of the call, no matter what you were saying, if you went over the five-minute mark, the operator disconnected you. It was bad for so many reasons. I remember when my, my commander told me that I was going, she called me up. It was November 1982, and she said, Sergeant Ellison, what are you having for dinner on, on Thanksgiving? And I said, ma'am, I'm like everyone else. I'm having turkey. She said, what a coincidence. I have orders that say you're going there. Not funny, not funny, <laughs> not, no, no, don't laugh, not good. And so there were a lot of reasons why I didn't want to go. I had young kids. My kids were going to do some things for the first time ever, and I would not see them. My wife was in nursing school. She would graduate. I would not be there for the graduation. My mother had been diagnosed with terminal cancer. She would not survive the year. I did not want to leave. There were things that she was going to go through that I needed to be there. I did not want to be in Turkey. But I went because I had raised my hand. And so while I was there, I was introduced to Ronald D. And I will not tell you his last name because someone here might be related to him. But I remember the first time I met him, you've heard that adage, you only get one time to make a first impression, you never get a second chance, and the first time was enough. I didn't know a uniform could be that wrinkled. And, and his pants, it was just because part of the fact was his stomach was so large, it, it just pushed down his pants, and so that, that slight break in the crease, it started at his knees and broke each way. And you hope, well, he doesn't live that life, but in fact, he did. And it was confirmed to me one night that I was going up the hill. The mission that we had was one of those critical missions. I can't tell you what we did because 
I'd have to shoot you, and I don't have a gun, and you're not going to stand in line to let me choke you, so I can't tell you. <laughs> but it was one of those critical missions, so you didn't want people who were not going to do their job. You needed people that you could depend on, but this night I get there, and I know that there's something wrong. I didn't know exactly what, but as I approached the site, I, I recognized the security lights at the door are off. And when I opened the door, it was like looking into a dark cave, and I couldn't see anything. So I felt around the corner, and I turned on the lights. And what I saw was absolutely amazing. The airman that I was supposed to relieve was lying on the floor. He was dressed in a black ninja outfit. The only thing I could see was his eyes, and he had an M16 pointed right at my chest. And I'm like, Twilight Zone. <laughs> Joke. Candid camera. I said, what are you doing? He said, night maneuver. And now I know I'm in the twilight zone. And the only thing I could think of next was, Airman, I am here to relieve you. You stand relieved. And he hopped up off the floor, and he handed me the weapon, and he was gone. And now I'm just sort of freaking out, but I begin to regain my consciousness. And I have that sense of an aroma that is permeating the building, and it's that unmistakable, pungent smell of cannabis. He is high. The weapon is loaded. The safety is off. And so immediately I call Ronald D. and I tell him, and he says, don't worry about it. I'll take care of it. Well, I hoped that he would, but when I got down that day, he says, it's all taken care of. Well, what did you do? Don't worry about it. Well, that night I went to bed, and the next thing I know, someone was knocking on my door. And when I opened it up, no one was there. But I heard a voice from down the hall that said, Ellison, if you don't keep your mouth shut, you'll never leave here, leave here alive. He had taken care of it by taking care of me. The next incident really defined who we was. I told you that my mother had terminal cancer, and that inevitable call came from the Red Cross. I was just approaching my 10th month there, and it said, your mother will not survive another two months. You need to come. And when I approached Sergeant HD about this, he told me, I don't know why you want to go home. The only thing you can do is watch your mother die. No compassion whatsoever. And then he said, if you go, you need to know I'm not going to put you in for a medal. Let me see. Medal, mom dying. This is not hard. I'm gone. And he was right. He didn't. When I left there, I knew I would not re-enter the I would not re-enlist in the Air Force. But for me, I was so blessed. I was so blessed because I got to see my mother. For two weeks, she was lucid. She knew that I was there. But she passed away. 40 days after I arrived. The name that you put on that piece of paper, fold it up and put it in your left pocket. And now I want you to think of someone who really you want to grow up to be, the person that you aspire to be when you grow up, the leader. He doesn't need to walk on water, doesn't need to have part at the Red Sea, but someone that you truly believe is the greatest leader that you've had the experience to have in your military career. Fortunately for me, it came right after that. A man by the name of Senior Master, Fra Master Sergeant Francis Diod. What an amazing guy. The Luke Consolidated Command Post had just failed an inspection. We were the worst command post in Tactical Air Command. And so they brought Frank Ott in to help reshape the command post. And 13 months later, we were the best command post in all of Tactical Air Command. I got the plaque to prove it. Frank Ott had transformed us. And the way that he did it was when he would come into the uh, command post in the morning, before he would ever go to his desk, he would go to each person in the command post and sit there and chat with you. He'd talk to you about your life, about your kids, about your aspirations. Are you in school? You need to be in school. Well, I heard you were coaching soccer. How is that going? How is your wife doing? He knew everything about you. His door was not just an open door. It was an inviting door. Everybody in the command post knew that Senior Mass Sergeant Ott cared about him, and that was the secret to his success. One day, one of our airmen, Senior Airman Tammy Kelly, came up positive on a random urinalysis, and the commander had a policy. He said, no matter what, if someone comes up, the leadership should never come to my office when they do their appeal. But Senior Airman Kelly had asked Senior Mass Sergeant Ott to accompany her, and so he did. And when he got there, the commander said, what are you doing here? And he told him, Senior Airman Kelly is my airman. He said, well, wait outside. He pronounced the sentence on, on Senior Airman Kelly, and then he brought Senior Mass Sergeant Ott back into the, his office. He says, you know my policy. And yes, I do. And then what are you doing here? And what he said will stick to, with me for the rest of my life. 
He said, Sergeant or Senior Airman Kelly is my airman. If she was here to get an award, I would be here. If she was here to get promoted, I would be here. The fact that she is here to be punished does not relieve me of my responsibility to her as her supervisor. Until she leaves the Air Force, she's my responsibility. He told Senior Master Sergeant Ott that he respected that, but he needed to understand he had violated a policy. He told Senior Master Sergeant Ott, you will never make chief. I respect what you did, but you violated one of our policies. Senior Master Sergeant Ott had eight years time and grade, but retired at 20 years one day in the United States Air Force. You'll find him in Del Rio, Texas. And if you ask him, does he regret going to the commander's office, he will tell you, no, it was the right thing to do. But he should have called the commander first because you never back your commander into a corner. He holds no regrets, and he holds no malice against the commander. He did what he needed to do, and he has no regrets about that. Take that piece of paper and put it in your right pocket. Now, you made a decision about those two people. And what you need to know is that every day, just like you made a choice about those people, people are making the same decision about you. And you have to understand, are you in their right pocket? Or are you in their left pocket? The people that work with you, the people that you associate with, make that same kind of judgment about you and what type of example you are. You don't get a choice whether or not you're an example. You are an example. The only choice you get to make is whether you're going to be a positive example or a negative example. And the difference between those two characters, the one in Turkey and Senior Master Sergeant Ott, was Senior Master Sergeant Ott truly cared about the people that worked for him. And I would guarantee you the person in your right pocket, that's why you put them there is that you believe in your heart of hearts that they truly care about you. And the old adage, we've heard it so many times before, is so true. People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. You want to be a great leader in the United States Air Force? Touch your airmen every day. You want to be a great husband? Let your wife know how much you appreciate her. You want to be a great father? Be there for your kids. My charge to you, to each and every one of you, every day, choose to be the person in your right pocket. Learn from the person in your left, but be the one in your right. God bless each and every one of you, and God bless the United States of America.